welcome. Uh, my name is Michalis, and uh, this is my exhibition. Uh, as uh, an artist in residence that I was for the last uh, two months in, uh, in Zion. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work I did here in the last uh, couple of months. But before I do that, I want to tell you a few things about what I do um, in general. Maybe that is going to help you better understand what I did here as well. I hope the screen is bright enough. If it's not, we can also uh, turn off one of these lights. I have a background in uh, architecture and in music. However, I never really practiced any of these two things in the common sense of these words. But they do inform my, my practice a lot and they, they fuel my practice a lot. Uh, I try to choose a different set of words to describe what I do. I chose these three words. So what I do involves a lot of design that comes from architecture. It involves a lot of machine making. And it also, it also involves uh, a lot of sound making as well. I do different things. One of them is that I make very weird looking musical instruments. This is the one I made four or five years ago. It works with strings fishing weights, which keep the strings under constant tension, and a few mechanisms that do a number of things. For example, you can shift these weights up and down to change the lengths the length of the strings and therefore the frequencies of these strings. You can also automate that middle uh, floor you see there. That's like a mechanical sequencer and you can use that to create this kind of movement to touch the strings. Uh, it doesn't sound as good as, I think it looks better than what it sounds. Uh, so I don't really show this project a lot anymore. This is another string instrument I, I made. A, I think I completed this one and a half years ago. And this was a big project. This took me around one and a half years to design and to develop. And then it took me another year to learn how to play this. So this, again, works with strings, but this time it works with electromagnets, which induce movement on these strings from a distance. I make my own uh, electromagnets, and I also made my own electronic interface that uh, you can use to control the signals that flow into these electromagnets thereby controlling precisely what the, how the string is moving. So this one actually sounds, I'm, I'm happy with this project and we can maybe watch a video afterwards. Uh, besides these instruments, I also like to work a lot with uh, kinetics and just machines. This, uh, this is a sculpture that uses six big magnets and uh, a planetary gear system. And then there's a lot of steel balls, around 800, I think, placed on this uh, glass surface. And the magnets affect the, the positions of these balls. So if you go underneath, you can observe these constellations that are constantly changing shapes. This is a this is the sound installation. We did this in collaboration with my with my brother. And this one involves three machines again that come into an interaction with the element of sound this time. And with this way they create these changing soundscapes. And this is another one we did again with my brother in Portugal. This, this one 
we, we made these this, uh, figures out of concrete and a machine placed on the ceiling would, would force them to move around in circles and just dance around each other and, and just scan the surface of the floor. There's also videos of these things, but I, I decided to uh, skip the videos and maybe save some time. If you want, we can watch these later. So there's, there's one thing that's common in all of these things that I make, whether that's the musical instruments or these, these machines, these kinetic installations. And, and that's the thing that you have this precise machine on one hand, and then you have this free material or a system of objects that is free to move around. So what this creates is a kind of complexity in motion that comes from the fact that from on one hand, these motions are determined by mechanical repetitive factors, and then you have the completely chaotic element <laughs> of these materials, whether it is steel balls or, or the strings or, or <laughs> fragments of clay in this, in this case, that are free to move within a set of limits and rules. This mixture between the, the order and, 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 and chaos gives me the complexity that I am, I'm looking for when I'm trying to create movement. So my tools are really motion on one hand and sound on the other. But since sound is also a kind of motion in itself, you can say just that essentially I'm interested in how things move. So when I came to uh, science to, to do my artist residency, I had, actually I had ideas about developing one of my previous instruments, uh, about improving it, let's say, and changing it. But then I found out that um, they have this amazing machine here, which works with uh, clay, and, it, and it's, a, it's a paste extruder that you, you can put any paste in it, and you can 3D print uh, in clay. So I, decided I'm going to skip my other ideas and I'm just going to work with clay and, and see what, what happens this time. So I came here with um, just like a blank page. Let, let's see what happens. And I, at the same time, I had this uh, image in my head of, of this column made out of fragments. And this column is constantly collapsing, but it's also rising up at the same time and I, I just I became obsessed with this uh, with this idea I had no clue how I was going to make this um, at the at the time so my idea was I, I will start to to create clay objects and then I'm going to break them and I will find a way to work with these fragments So I actually started to create a series of objects just without no rules, completely arbitrary decisions here. Uh, I even made a little uh, patch, even though I, I don't usually like to work with, um, with uh, let's say, programming. I made this little patch that created these uh, textures on the outside of these, um, of these pots, as if someone has, has squeezed them while they were rotating on the on the wheel. I made, uh, well, I made a, a few different geometries and for well, the first time we tried to print out these things, you get these uh, kind of things, which this one, we actually have it somewhere, but I think I forgot to include it in the exhibition, unfortunately. But uh, I was trying to print out, for example, this uh, straight column, which is basically the wrong geometry to print out in this machine because it's completely uh, unstable. So it would just collapse in this beautiful shape. It looks like a body that's leaning forward or something like this. And this could also be a project in itself if I would uh, continue uh, this way, to these, these mistakes and the way things collapse. But I was becoming so obsessed with the idea of this 
of this column that I just wanted to find a way to uh, make my fragments one way or another. And at this point, I, I spoke to a lot of people who work with, with clay. I think some of them are here and, and, and some are, are not. Um, so I was going from one person to the other and asking about uh, just different types of clay that I can get, different techniques I can make these fragments from. Uh, at the same time, I was uh, doing my own uh, little uh, handmade uh, pieces in uh, Effie's, Effie and Kaupo's studio. Uh, where is Effie? Oh, she's not here. Okay. Um, and I was uh, working a lot with these uh, industrial grade clays. This is terracotta, for example. It's the most standard type of clay I think you can get in Cyprus. Uh, yeah, I forgot to uh, turn that off. Um, I didn't really like the color on this clay, so I uh, I started this procedure of doing making my own pieces. Uh, but I was still um, I will I was still asking people around what I, what maybe I could find like ready-made pots and then break them and work with these fragments. I found out that when when clay is baked, then it's almost impossible to pierce through it, so I wouldn't be able to use it in a machine in this way. Uh, and when uh, talking to uh, different people, I I came across one of the most interesting things, which was Alejandro's work. I don't know how to pronounce his surname, by the way. Uh, can Villafit. So Alejandro uh, works with clay, but the interesting thing is that he makes his own clay. He actually collects. Uh, mat materials from Cyprus soils, and he makes his own uh, clay. And and his objects have incredible uh, textures and colors. So I uh, I spoke with Alejandro, and he agreed to share his material with me. And he gave me around 10 kilos of clay, which I put in this basket. It's not a very elegant photograph, but this was the uh, initial quantity of clay I had to work with. So I just I just kept obsessively doing this process of making handmade pieces out of clay, and then uh, this is again in Effie's uh, studio. Uh, you have to wait for them to dry, and then I was um, whilst they were drying, I I was creating these holes in them so that maybe I can use them um, to mount them on, on something or uh, and and make a machine out of them. These pieces were fired in a kiln at a temperature of 1100 degrees. At a temperature they have never, Alejandro at least had never uh, even tried these temperatures before. So we were very happy with the textures and the, and the colors that, that this clay brought out. So I ended up with around 170 pieces in the end of this process. So now I have to go from here to here. Now in the meantime, while I was doing these things, I was also designing some small machines and some small mechanisms that would uh, allow me to, uh, to create the movement I had in my mind at this movement, I started to analyze this movement a little bit, and I realized that what I want to do is I want to have these, let's say, these parallel lanes of pieces that, that just move up and down against each other. And this would give you this constant illusion that this object is constantly falling, but also it's constantly rising. And then, and then I remembered where I got this image from. I was in Crete last summer and then uh, just one night we were we were just watching the 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 sea and it was completely dark and you had a full moon just above the horizon and this is an image that you know we probably have seen many times but uh, that night it just struck me as in incredible because you would see these reflections in the water 
as little horizontal bright pieces that seemed to move through each other and just into each other and up and down. And I, I could see this kind of um, vertical movement that I, I realized later that I wanted to do with uh, this clay. So it's just a way how ideas connect in my mind. So then it's the question of how you do this. So I made this little machine. You can also see that there actually, I don't know why I'm playing the video, but it's, it's just right there. So I made this machine to, uh, to go from uh, basically the movement of a motor, which is just rotational movement, to linear movement of these pieces going up and down and against each other in, in opposite, uh, in opposite uh, velocities, let's say. The next step was how to, uh, let's say, make this a little bit more complex. So uh, the next prototype I made here looks like this, and you can also take a look uh, later if you want. It's basically the same system, but instead of two uh, points, you now have eight different points to go to. Let me just grab this for a second. You have this motor underneath, and then you have this axis, which now I cannot rotate because it's electrical. And then you have this node here. On this node, you can start collect connecting strings, and you can go to the uh, to the perimeter of this uh, section. So if you look at it from a top view, let's say that's the top view on the left. This top view. You just go from this node, you go to these eight different points in the periphery of this circle. So. If you look at it, let's say from the side, if you look at this thing, let's say this, uh, this is now above us, and this, the strings are hanging, and you get this kind of tilted, you get this tilted uh, circle since this node is pushing on the strings in one direction. So if this thing would start to rotate, then this um, disc would start to just wobble. Hmm? And if you were to uh, out all of those points on a, on a, on a linear axis, you would, get, you would get a nice sinusoidal curve where each point is, is, is following the movement of the next point. Mm -hmm. But in this case, then, you would have, let's say, very uniform uh, movement where all of these elements, they just follow each other. And you never have these movements that go against each other like I wanted to do. So what I did was I just made it just a tiny bit more complicated by, by, by switching uh, points uh, amongst, uh, let's say, against each other. So I just uh, flipped some of these positions, like actually took the string and placed it on the opposite side of this circle. And so my movement is mixed up. And these are my resulting, where's my mouse? Oh, my mouse. Here are my points now, and you can see that the directions in which these points are moving now are almost always uh, in opposite ways because of this flip. Uh, you can just see this on top of that object. I think it's visible from here. This is the story of this machine. I also did something else while I was here at time. This is uh, the project I, I showed you before, and I said at some point we might we might watch a video, and I think this is a good point to uh, to put that video on. Just go a little bit louder.
so this was the, the Lyrae. This instrument took me a couple of years to, um, to create. And as I said before, it works with just simply strings, electromagnets, and a electronic interface. Uh, when I finished this instrument, I, I had no ideas about what else to make in the future. I was just completely blank for a year or so. And then I remembered my older instruments, which, which used to work with these weights. And these instruments had something very special. You could, you could, you could move these weights up and down, and you could ju just get these really tiny changes in frequency, as is what happens when you change the length of a string um, in a very smooth and uniform way. So I thought I want to combine this, you know, this this, this kinetic aspect on one hand with electromagnetics that I I've now been working on for. Uh, two years. So I thought I would make another instrument. Um, so this is like we're looking at the cross section of, of a room right now. So the, the, the bottom piece of wood is the floor and the top piece of uh, wood is the ceiling. So this structure would just be hanging from ceiling and it's made to be uh, quite big actually maybe for spaces that are four to four and a half, maybe even five meters high. Um, I didn't go into detail when, when designing this thing. It's just an idea that uh, I just kind of came up with. This is just to give you an idea of the scale I'm thinking about uh, giving this object. And the way it works is you, you of course, you have all of these strings and, and these weights uh, going down to the floor which again, they can move up and uh, down if you simply just touch and drag them. And the top part of the instrument works exactly in the same way as the lirai that I showed you before. So it would have, again, uh, pulleys on top of the instrument so that it can slide uh, effortlessly. The weights I'm estimating about probably 1,500 grams uh, on each side. And then you have, again, a driver coil. That's the electromagnet that, that is causing the movement uh, on the string. And then you have a pickup coil that is uh, the microphone. From there, I can receive the sound and then amplify it. Uh, these electromagnets are really the, the, uh, the heart of this uh, instrument. I make this myself, and it's usually a like it's quite painful process because you have to really make everything yourself. This is a, one of the big ones, and this is one of the uh, smaller ones. And this one, I like if you just look at this thing, it's just a, a bolt with a shaved head. You can see that on the on the left, and then I place a small 3D printed plastic uh, to um, to create the face of the electromagnet. And then there's a permanent magnet, and then that goes back. It's a really tiny object. It's quite annoying to uh, try to handle. So then you put this on a drill, and you have to do the windings. And then you have to check that it's the resistance that uh, you want. So uh, knowing that I will still be working with electromagnets for quite some time now, I designed my own, uh, let's say, case for them, so this is all in one object. You can just take this and place an iron core in the middle, and uh, again, place this on a drill and, and do the windings. So I'm still gonna make my own cores, but this, at least it's kind of more, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit, uh, it's gonna save me some time. So we printed these out in the SLA printers in the workshop, and we, we tried many different materials, but the one we chose was best for this job was the, um, was the high temperature uh, resin because and this, these are like uh, baked now, so that's why they're yellow. Uh, this material can take up really high temperatures, which might occur when you uh, constantly excite on electromagnets. It just gets warmer and warmer. And I've already noticed that I have this problem in my older instruments. So it's good that the, the plastic part can take that heat so you can play for prolonged periods of time. Uh, so this is just one of the parts that is going to go into this new instrument. Hopefully I can uh, start to uh, work on this soon. Uh, maybe maybe in a year or so we can uh, 
uh, have some results. And uh, I think I have nothing else to say, actually. <laughs> so uh, thanks for, uh, thank you for coming. And if you have anything you want to ask, this, uh, this is a good time. Yeah, thanks. Put the music uh, again. I would like to ask. Mm -hmm. So, what's your background with music? You are playing instruments from younger. Or? Well, I started to play the guitar when I was twelve, and that's basically it. I, I, you know, I did the thing where you go to the lessons and you learn. I, I was trained in the classical guitar and then in the electric guitar. Then I was playing in bands and everything. Um, then I started to uh, play with synthesizers at, at some point because I was uh, kind of tired of the guitar. I felt it was kind of limited. You couldn't do a lot of things on it. And then I, I went into electronics and then basically I combined these two things together. Yeah, so the, the strings instruments are electronic instruments in the sense that the what what create what drives the strings is a completely electronic uh, procedure, but it's translated into a, into a physical uh, movement yeah, with all these complexities, and that's why I work with with physical materials to to get these textures that you can't I think you can't get out of a synthesizer, for example. Yeah. The strings for specifically, or the machines, or as a whole, the piece as a whole. Yeah, that's always an issue. Um, I try to work with materials like you know uh, wood and metal, the just simplest and most robust materials you can get, so that I have you know uh, as le fewer problems possible in in the future. Strings, for example, you can just change if you say go bad. Um, the I think the most um, sensitive issue is electronics, because now I started to work with, uh, you know, this electronic interface is all uh, handmade. I solder the capacitors in, the resistors and everything. So if something burns on this interface, now I have to find it. And, and what is it? You can't, if, if you lose a capacitor, you have to start uh, taking everything apart to find out which capacitor. So the electronics, I'm at this, uh, moment I'm more, let's say, afraid of uh, than the actual materials. Usually you have like these, um, you know, the structural elements like metal, wood, these are going to last, you know, longer than me probably in some, in most cases. And then you have the parts that are, uh, how do you say, the analosima, the um, consumables, let's say, that we are going to wear out and you have to replace them. But it's not, definitely not a priority to like make everything last. I just figure out ways uh, in, the, in the process to do it. Well, this is a very good question. Um, the the I I I would say I have like a very particular aesthetics in the in the sense that I um, I try to make things a little bit elegant and um, a little bit weird, but mostly I try to keep everything transparent that you can see how everything works and you can see all the mechanical parts on the, all the electronic parts, but at the same time I use these really just ancient. Um, let's say, um, 
not ancient, just uh, let's call it medieval. Uh, they're a little bit medieval in the way they're structured. Right? You have these big gears, you have these big ha hanging things. And I think that's kind of important because I, I think someone who is watching something, uh, whether that it's a kinetic sculpture, it's an instrument, it's a sound sculpture, it's important that they can understand how this thing works and kind of get get lost in it, in the way it works, and then you can just go deeper and, and just discover the thing on your own. So uh, the the key word here is, is transparency, that I try to make designs that allow you to read through them. Yeah. Yes, Pali. Hello. Thanks. I mean, there's, there's a few reasons I make these instruments ver vertical. I'll just go back to the uh, the other one. So this instrument, for example, if you take out the, the two legs in the, in the base of this object, you can take this out no? from here. You take this out, you can lay the instrument down horizontally, and it will still work. But I don't play it like this because uh, it could be easier for a studio session. Maybe you lay it down and you record something. But I've actually never done this because it was just more practical to have it like this and, and watch it. And also, if you play this in a concert or in a, just a live setting, I want, the, I want the people to be able to look at this thing, you know, and, and just read through it. But also the other thing with the vertical elements is that you can al always do these games with gravity and these just micro movements that you get with pendulums. Uh, so that's what I now want to combine again with the electronics and see what kinds of sounds you get. Okay, let me see if I understand. I will try to uh, answer precisely. The the thing is when I, I, as I explained before, this just this idea of the collapsing column, it, at first it came to me as a, like a visual, uh, just this visual idea. And then I started to wonder what's gonna happen if these clay pieces start to just gently bounce off each other and what kind of sounds can they make? And from there, I just try things out and see what works. I see what I like. Uh, I don't think too much about it. So um, I was um, in, uh, where is that here again? Ah, I was in uh, Epic Studio and we were just playing around with some pieces of clay. I was uh, seeing what kind of sound, you know, big pieces of clay make, what kind of sound do small ones, different uh, parts make, different materials. 
um, I never concluded anywhere. Like I like those more than the others. I just said, I'm, I'm just gonna make my thesis and see what happens. I even started to put everything on this machine. And at first, uh, you yeah, just you had these collisions, like everything was just uh, crashing against each other, these violent sounds. So then I started to slowly break pieces out of it to make it more gentle. And then I just stopped at a point where I could now, when I see it, I, I see something of that thing I had in my, I, in my mind in the first place. It kind of just sticks to me a little bit. And, and then the sound, sometimes the sound can be secondary, for example. I was also considering to, to have it completely silent. And if you change a little bit, it's possible to make it silent. But I like it to be just close to silence, but not, it's like this uh, sound you hear at night, for example. Mm -hmm. so. so this is it. I don't think too much about it. I just like uh, just by uh, working through it. And also, it's on the. Um, it's it's a very young project. You know, it's it, it, if I had this in my studio, and then every uh, month maybe I change something. Maybe then in a year it's something totally different. But it's very young. It's it's made really like in just like two three weeks. The entire assembly. Um, in the things I've made, you said earlier about the uh, about that performance that first you you made it and then you learned about the space. Yeah. How did that? How how did that uh, process work? How did the process work? How do you uh, consider an instrument and then the sound that it makes? So the sound it, that it's going to make, I, I already have this in my mind. I know what the sound is going to be like. Because I have, let's say, my prototype. I have this piece of wood with one string on it, and I'm experimenting with this electromagnet. At some point, I see, oh, if I do this, it makes this sound, etc. And I, that's my starting point. I, I, I take the, I, I, I listen to the sound and then I say, okay, I want to have six voices of this. I want to have eight voices of this textural sound. Uh, so I start to design the machine that can just structurally take all of these and actually have an interface to control all these things. But of course, I don't know how to play it yet. I just know how it's going to function. So I know that I will have these uh, levels of control on my electromagnet amplitude and um, intensity. And I've already tested out with my experiments that these, just these two factors alone are enough to create the complexity. But when I make the interface and I put, you know, I put everything together and it's basically the first time I'm playing it, it could sound horrible at, at first for a few months because once you learn how to tame this, it's like a, a wild horse, this thing. It's just doing its own thing, especially with the electromagnet. Also, signals are, are flowing, uh, flowing uh, into each other, and sometimes you, the instrument does things you don't want to, you don't want them to happen. Um, cacophonies and things like this. You have to learn how to control these things. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers. Uh, the, well, how does that relate with the new experiment? With the new one. The one that you're trying yeah. to. Yeah. Well, with the new one, so now I have this, you know, I know that th what kind of, of, of what kind of sound can be possible. And I want to even just keep going and see, okay, what happens now if I, if I add movement to the strings? So based on this system that you've listened uh, in the video, what's going to happen if now the string is free to move? So I'm adding a level of uh, freedom in movement and, and seeing what happens. So this is something I haven't tested yet. I don't know how this sounds. Without. So I will make a prototype, hang these weights, put the electromagnet, see what happens then. If it's interesting, then I, ju I just keep building on it. But the learning is always a huge process because even though the object is capable of many beautiful things, it's also um, possible to go really wrong with it. You know, because it's very delicate. Um, uh, it's completely handmade, uh, the electronics are faulty most of the time.
Yeah, it's a pro good project. Oh, this one. Uh, uh, the pendulum. Of course, yeah. So the pendulum is coming up with the 2,000 meter length. Uh, I would say I haven't decided on that yet. So even though I, I showed you our more or less for four and a half meters, but uh, it's just usually if you, um, the appropriate space for this kind of sound is not, let's say, three meters high. The appro appropriate spaces for this sound are between four and six meters. So I already know that to, uh, if I wanna make an object that is architectural size, which is my idea for this instrument, and I want it to be vertical, it's gonna be more or less the same height with the space. But there's no a specific um, dimension to this instrument because you can always use just shorter strings and this, uh, you know, it, this, this uh, instrument you can expand it as long as you can and you can shorten it because you can simply change the string. What about the weight difference? Yeah, so 1.5, if you just grab that notebook that's behind you. I just have that, I, I have some measurements. Oh, you can just open it. I already made some measurements in my studio in the Netherlands. So I, I use a specific thickness of string because it's really easy to work with, but it's not really strong. So I measured with, uh, for example, two kilo weight. What happens when you have the string at 75 centimeters? What happens if you have your three meters? And I, I, I wanna, I know what range of frequencies I wanna get. So if you use some mathematics, you can, uh, find which weight is suitable for the frequency you want to, or the range of frequencies you want to get, because remember you're always changing the length, but the weight is uh, standard. Of course, you can always choose to use heavier weights, let's say one of the times, and then you will have a little bit higher frequency. If you put less weight, you have a little bit lower frequency. And this you can figure out. So one and a half kilo is just my, my uh, so my first round of uh, calculations. Could be also a little bit less, I think. Yeah. The Lirai. This is the Kiklopono. Uh, yeah. going to have in incredible stability problems, this whole project. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult to do this project. I know that already. And it's, it's going to be uh, even the balancing of this thing to get it straight yeah, and to get the... Time. So it's going to be in a, also especially with these lengths. Imagine you have a string that's three meters uh, long. So I know this is going to be like technically it's going to be a nightmare to, to get this right. Uh, I do have an I idea actually, uh, which is to have another set of, let's say you have this, um, just, I don't know, just to think of a, a, a linear piece of wood that has, again, the, the, the same tool as you have upstairs, you have, you have them on the floor, and then you just go with the, with the, another whatever kind of string and you complete the loop. So now it's just, you know, it's kind of held, but it's still free to move. 
but it, it cannot do this uh, crazy movement. Yes. Yes. So all of these ideas are, are good ideas. What else? Colleagues with some other points? Ah, yes. Thanks. Okay. No, at the moment I can't do that because they're the purpose of these instruments that initially these are made to satisfy my own needs for the kind of music I want to play. Okay. So I started with the guitar and then the electronics and this and that, and then I thought oh, I want to make this kind of sound, so let's make an instrument for this. Okay. So I make the instrument thinking that I'm going to play it and, and how it's going to work, how it's going to sound like. Uh, it's for my own uh, musical needs, mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that. Uh, so for me, it's an artwork. This is an, this is I'm making an artwork that goes together with this specific type of performance. But that doesn't mean that in five, ten years, I couldn't make uh, a commercial, uh, let's say, version of this, like mm -hmm. an electromagnetic. But I that's just something I don't think about that at the moment. It's a, they have to be unique, and they go with as a performance act. Okay. Don't sell it as an instrument.